Well, hello, uh, our friends. Um, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 35 today. Um, Josh will not be with us. Uh, his whole family is very sick, and he's the most functional person and has to take care of the rest. So we're going to do this without Josh. The purpose of Corner to Corner Bible Study is to just kind of model um, studying the Bible together and encouraging people to sit down with the Bible and read together and share what the Lord is saying to us through the verses that we read. And so here we are. I'm Lowell and Greg uh, with the short gray hair and Mark with the, the nice Norwegian beard. And so um, it's it's good to have you guys on board and hope that um, hope that you will join in uh, reading with us and um, thinking over these things that have been preserved to us through the Apostle Mark, Mary, the Apostle Matthew, I'm sorry. There you go. And so <clears throat> chapter 26, one, Greg, could you read through chapter verse 13? Yeah, we'll do that. So I'm Greg, and uh, we're gonna re I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, you know that the two days, you know that after two days is the Passover and the son of man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests, the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly, fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this fragrance, this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told of her, told as a memorial to her. Mark, would you do the next section, please? Uh, certainly, I'm Mark, and I'm also reading from the uh, New King James uh, translation, uh, chapter, or excuse me, verse 14. Uh, then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver, so from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Now, on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, 
You have said it. And I'm Lowell, and I'll be reading from New American Standard Translation, verse 26 to 35. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. After singing the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Jesus said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you that this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing, too. Mm -hmm. And so um, just to let you know, um, we do not study commentaries and go into an intense research before um, doing these corner-to-corner -corner studies. We want to share from just what is standing out to us and and uh, is really pertinent and profoundly applicable to our lives. And so, um, guys, what are the um, what things stand out to you? Their first thoughts as we have read through these thirty five mm -hmm. verses. Wow. Well, the countdown has begun. More than more, you know, we're it's pretty uh, interesting to me, very interesting to me that, you know, you've got, here's Matthew, it's 28 chapters. And yet it does, you know, the 28 chapters aren't divided up fairly equally over his lifetime. The, the, the things that happened early, they're in the earlier chapters, but at least two thirds of this book is dedicated to those, those final encroaching hours. That last, week or so three weeks before something like that so here that it is and it's culminating and i just think it there's a lot in here that is um being highlighted by matthew he's the writer that he is highlighting this tremendous um i'm going to say you know exchange with this man and his disciples here before his is journey to the cross. So there's a lot here that's going to speak to that. Amen. Amen. In, in this passage that we've just read the first half of, uh, really the chapter 26, I think what we see, we see a contrast between um, uh, Jesus and uh, his disciples mm -hmm. uh, gathering together for the last couple of days of Jesus uh, ministry before he goes to the cross and and the contrast is with um the uh high priest and the sanhedrin and uh in particular Judas uh the the disciple that betrayed the lord um and what's going on if you will behind the scenes of uh what's emphasized here in the Lord's um, speaking and meeting uh, with his disciples. Yeah. The thing that stood out to me is uh, just kind of framed in verse four, where the chief priests and elders meet together and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth yeah. and kill him. They wanted a quick and and uh, final solution to their problem. Yeah. And we see man's plans and God's purpose. 
And Jesus' crucifixion was as public as anything could possibly be. And um, it is not accidental. It's not a victory for man. It is a completion of God's purpose of salvation for mankind. And I think <clears throat> we always have to keep that in focus in our personal lives. <clears throat> is that there are those purposes that men have to do us harm and hurt and agendas of evil. But it is always God's plan that overshadows that mm -hmm. and his purpose that shall be completed. And especially as we're living in these troubled days, man has plans, God has purpose. And it is such a blessing to be a part of the kingdom of God and his great purpose on this earth. Mm -hmm. salvation of people yeah. yeah so the um just to pick up on that a uh, low so the the circumstance here where this woman mm -hmm. brings her um jar uh into meet with the lord and she pours the um the perfume all over his head to in effect, anoint him for burial. Um, and it's the contrast is there's someone among the disciples, likely uh, Judas, but somebody says, well, come on, this doesn't make sense. We could we could take this uh, oil, this fragrance, and sell it and give it to the poor. Yeah. It, you know, why, why are we doing this? And the Lord... Um, stands behind the gal and notes that and confirms that she understands God's purpose in this uh, circumstance and at this very time. And she's in tune with the Lord's spirit. Um, and uh, it's God's purpose that uh, this oil was used uh, to bless the Lord and not to bless the poor. Can you think of anything better that that perfume could have been used for? Yeah, no. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And that, that statement, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 13, is so powerful. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the entire world, the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Amen. And and it's not like the telling is, you know, like in your storybook, and I'm going to preach the gospel to you, and here's this story. It's in the, I think it's much more in the telling of how over the centuries, the real gospel preaching that's been taken out has been at great cost. This was everything she had. Doesn't mention it here, but it, you know, she was, she had this and, and very costly ointment and she poured it out on him lavishly, you know, without withholding. And that's the testimony of what has happened. I mean, uh, recently, uh, several people that my wife and I are connected with, kids and elderly amazingly we're we're handing out people want to read these historical biographies of these people the gospel they've taken the gospel out at great cost even sometimes of their lives and uh that's the story yeah yeah on that note this was a sacrifice <clears throat> for this woman yeah and when you use the word sacrifice, people's mind usually goes to the Old Testament, you know, an animal or uh, a wave offering or something. But the greatest sacrifice is praise. And and um, a sign of, of um, beautiful worship is at our worst time, our most difficult time, our most fearful time that we worship the Lord. Amen. And here on in mm -hmm. a day or two, 
before the Lord shed his blood, there's this beautiful, beautiful anointing and worship of Jesus' body that is going to be nailed to a cross. Yeah. And and what a what a um what a wonderful touch before he went to do what he was going to do. What a marvelous opportunity. You know, I read this article a number of years ago that um somebody he was a, a scientific guy, he noted that when we smell something, it's kind of like a picture. When you see a picture, you know, and, and you recall something that happened years mm -hmm. ago. When you, same thing with smell, it triggers something. Somebody can come in, had a bad experience with some kind, that, that some kind of odor, and they smell that odor, and immediately their memory gets triggered back to something yeah. in their life. Yeah. He postulated that part of this in God's sovereign hand that, that fragrance hung with him through everything he was about to walk through. And that on the cross, he had still that fragrance. And perhaps he smelled that and it just triggered the love that this woman had for him that she would pour out everything for him. Amen. It gave him the strength, the human strength, it's human, to, to go through that brutal thing the whole way. That's quite a thought. Yeah, it was. It was very insightful, I think. You know, um, I had, I don't know that this really relates, but I'm going to sh share it. I just had this thought that, Lo, you, you talk about sacrifice. This this was a sacrifice for this woman. Um, I, I, my, I'm, I'm made to think of that occasion when uh, David, uh, King David, before yeah. Saul, um passed that uh he was in effect um he was being chased by Saul and uh he was with his uh, many of his mighty men anyway um several of his men ran through uh those who weren't supporting Saul and uh got some water there the David had said I'm thirsty and they went and they uh to the pool or wherever it was they drew water from and they brought it back uh, running a gauntlet if you will of uh those who were chasing after David and them and brought it to David and David didn't thirsty though he was he didn't drink it he yeah, said this them. I'm he poured it out yeah. You know, as if it were like a drink offering mm -hmm. um, that might be sacrificed. Yeah. And he said, this is for the Lord. Um, this this sacrifice, this oil poured on the Lord's head. He, um, Yes, it was a sacrifice for uh, the woman. And um, I, I think uh, hearing about uh, the, the idea that the, the smell of it, the fragrance, would stick with uh, Jesus through his ordeal. I um, I can believe that. I I can I I um, think that is uh, a reasonable mm -hmm. uh, speculation. It brings that, us to Romans twelve one. Yeah. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service worship yes. or reasonable service of worship. Yeah. And the most pour our lives out to the Lord Amen. as a sweet offering to him. Yes. Amen. How about this next section with the uh, guys around the table here? <laughs> yeah. You gonna skip over Judas bargain for with the chief priests? No, no, first oh no, this is when he does it, right? The twelve. Yeah, verse fourteen. He, fourteen, yeah. We're gonna yeah. get into that whole section there. Like that. Yeah. And God. it's interesting, Judas betrays Jesus for thirty pieces of silver. And in that context, the Lord is taking the bread and the cup. And 
as manifesting his uh, payment for us. Judas got 30 pieces of silver for betraying Jesus. For us, Jesus gave us all. One is getting and losing. The other one is giving and winning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, 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 it's hard to enter into the mind of what was going on with uh, Judas. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, I can understand if it was just some kind of um, notoriety guy that was up on a stage and was flashy and, you know, okay, I admire him and I'm going to, you know, follow after him. But he walked with Jesus, you know, it must have been two plus years at least. And, you know, to watch him in, you know, what he was doing, what he was saying, and and still, um, yeah, I still try to wrestle with that, so. Yeah, we, I think we, I don't know, I, I wrestle with all, with the ideas that are kicked around about, well, what prompted Judas? Was he, um, did he think he could prompt Jesus to... Yeah. Uh, declare himself the king in a way that he would then turn and do battle with the Romans and lead the Jews in rebelling. Uh, um, you know, you try to, I, I don't know, you, you want to uh, figure it out. And I, 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 there's no figuring it out. He, he, except to, you know, we land on what the Lord says about, about it, that, it would have been better if he'd never been born. I think you hit on something there, though, Mark. Many people, I scratch many, some people um, decide to enter into Christian community or even become a Christian thinking that is some kind of a fairy tale thing that I accepted Jesus and they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> they begin to see the writing on the wall that there are going to be problems, there are going to be costs, and things are not going to work out as we had anticipated. And so you you pull the parachute cord and bail out. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe Judas had some expectations of grandeur that were going to play out in his life. And when he began to see the storm clouds gathering and the situation developing into um, opposition to Jesus and that he's going to lose his life. Why not jump on that bandwagon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that makes me think about um, a few years back, I heard uh, one of the underground church leaders from Iran sharing you know they he had gone there this guy had got saved and he was preaching the gospel and a lot of people were coming to christ because of the you know kind of the, the whole thing over there with uh you know the mullahs r running everything and being so abusive to everybody and just stealing everybody's money and uh when the authorities started to notice what they were doing, they went after the Christians and about three quarters of the Christians abandoned their faith because of the persecution. And it was at that time he reflected in the, in the group that the leaders of that uh, movement were reflecting and they said, we, we failed to teach them like the Lord did. And so if you go back in, in these chapters before this, you will see that the Lord started to condition them to be ready for persecution. Yeah. Anyone that doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not Absolutely. worthy of me. Yeah. And so there is a significant lack, I believe, in, in the, the churches in the West, particularly to that understanding. You know, I mean, we've had a good ride for quite a while. 
a very easy ride, you know, in the, in the church community. We, you know, maybe somebody persecutes us, says something mean about us and says we're stupid or something like that to believe this fairy tale kind of stuff like that. But it's nothing compared to, you know, what these guys were now facing. And uh, so just a thought there. Now on the Lord's Supper, you know, it's interesting this, and my study Bible that I'm using today <clears throat> has a caption, the last Passover. I usually don't pay attention to study Bible captions because they're not scripture, but it's kind of an interesting thought. This is the last Passover. It is, yeah. It's a fulfillment of what the first Passover was all about yeah. and the destiny that God had for the people of Israel and for mankind is that a lamb would be slain, the lamb of God, who would take away the sin of the world once and for all, not to be repeated year after year after year. And um, that the Lord reclined at table with the disciples knowing that and giving meaning to that, yeah. that time together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in, in conjunction with that, the, uh, you know, the, the celebration of Passover, it looked backwards to uh, the deliverance of uh, the children of Israel from out of Egypt, led by Moses. At the same time, as a foreshadowing, it looked forward to yeah. uh, the Lord's sacrifice at yeah. Calvary. Yeah. And the Lord's <clears throat> Supper, um, it looks at Calvary the Lord's coming to be crucified and die for our sins. But also, um, it looks forward to his coming again. Oh, and yeah. We need to keep that in mind when Amen. we celebrate the Last Supper. Eat this bread and drink this cup until I come. Yeah. 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 You know, when we uh, do some uh, with the small groups that we meet with, we have communion at least once a month and i like to read from first corinthians 11 where paul adds that one verse that uh, we do this it's a display of what happened and it's also an announcement he's coming again because he got raised so yeah yeah the lord said here i will not drink of this fruit of the vine until i from now on until the day when i drink it new with you in my father's kingdom amen <clears throat> yeah so we are going to have a very big um party beyond anything yeah. ever done before i don't know who's going to cater it fish and chips for everybody <laughs> huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting how through the Lord's Supper and this this whole passage it's a betrayal. And the Lord at the Last Supper singled out the one who would betray him as being on the table and, and the the centrality of that human tragedy mm. um, is is central to this whole thing to mm. betray innocent blood. You know, I'm going to take a, a little you know, with that, Lowell, I'm going to take a, just a little turn here. You know, the, a lot of um, over the last couple of years, and there's some things going on right now where People are awakening to the church leadership that has is is been living a facade for years, um, and uh, you know with uh, affairs and all kinds of stuff, and you know we, we need to be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves. This this is not something new. It happened here in our reading, and it's happening today. And I think, again, 
and I admit my own self, um, I'm naive with many things. I think, you know, everybody's just nice people, yeah. but, you know, uh, I, I should have I grabbed this before. I didn't think of it. But uh, one of an author I read years ago, Frank Herbert, of all guys, who wrote Dune, uh, mm -hmm. which is now out in a movie, but he said, it's not power that corrupts. It's the corruption that's already in them. And the power just gives them the opportunity to expose yeah. the corruption. And I thought that was very insightful, too. You know, it's there. We've got this uh, leaven stuff in us. And uh, given the right opportunity, it just comes out. And it can come out. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. It can come out. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, and it even does come out, and as the Lord and says, Peter. you're all yeah. gonna, you're all yeah. gonna desert me here, and yes, and here, I mean, in contrast, it, it, it it's a little bit of a contrast with, <clears throat> yeah. uh, um, Judas is Peter saying, "Well, not me, Lord, I'm not gonna desert yeah. you, even if everybody else, I'm not." That's the last thing that we read here. Peter says, mm, "Even if I have to die, I'm not gonna." Uh, deny you and um yeah we we hear a little bit more of the story uh come next week um in that regard yeah but um it's a different uh kind of denial on peter's part than uh Judas. and in dealing with that whole thing mark you know it, it just occurred to me how do we deal with human failure? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do we pretend as though it does not pertain to us and that, right. that you know, everything's fine, I didn't do anything wrong? Or do we go into um, guilt and self-condemnation and uh, develop a loser syndrome? Or do we process it as Peter had to yeah. with the grace of God and the word of God? What Peter did was no surprise to the Lord, yeah. nor was what Judas did any surprise to the Lord, because the Lord knows what's in the heart. Yeah. And it's really important to, to function from the heart. Um, speaking from my own point of view, I'm fallible. But the question is, do I have a heart for the Lord? Amen. Do do I do I have a desire to do what's right? And am I willing to be conformed by his mercy and his grace into the person that he wants me to be? But we are not superheroes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And may we learn that lesson well. Yeah. But some don't. It's unfortunate. It's very sad, but some don't. Yeah. You know, it, what is it that it says that I'm trying to think of in Corinthians when when Paul um, hands over the young man that was having a relationship with his father's wife. And uh, he turned him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that he might be saved. And then he, in Second Corinthians, he repents, and it's the, it's the, yeah, here it is. He says, "Now I rejoice." This is in Second Second Corinthians chapter seven. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. He's talking to the Corinthian believers, but that your sorrow led to repentance. And I think that's what you just mentioned there. For many were made so for. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, so that you might not suffer loss from us in anything. For godly sorrow, godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And so, yeah. The, the contrast there again with Judas and Peter, you're gonna we can see it in not only here, but we're going to see it other places. Yeah. yeah. Ready for final thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. 
mine is this woman who poured the precious perfume ointment upon the body, body of Jesus. She was a small person doing a small thing. And yet she's remembered throughout all of history, recorded in scripture. And so many times we think that we have to be some big hero or a well-known individual in order to, to have standing in the kingdom of God. But um, such is not the case. The Lord singled out what the world would see as small people doing what the world would consider absurd things. And the Lord singles them out and lifts them up. It's a marvelous example to, to others. And, you know, the people there listening uh, to this, they're no small things and they're no small people. Amen. Amen. And the Lord loves you and your response to him is profoundly significant. Yeah. And the significance is eternal. Those stick in there. Amen. Yeah. Um, my, my final thought really um, is, is just to um, pick up on the fact that the last part of this passage that we've read um, is addressed in the other Gospels, and in particular um, in John. Uh, John chapter 13, uh, John chapter 14, uh, 15 through 17, just virtually a monologue by the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, he yeah. says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. This is when he's talking to the disciples at this time. He mm -hmm. talks about being the vine and our father being the vine dresser. And we are the branches. The disciples are the branches. Um, he 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 talks about praying uh, in John seventeen about all of us who come in the wake of the start of the church and generation after generation building up the church. The church falling away and building up again. Um, so I, I just you know. The, the the little bit that we read here, and there's there's so much more to it. And the Lord, yeah, amen. It, it, it's you know he he, he we read about uh, the institution, if you will, of the beginning of the Lord's Supper. But wow, um, there's there's so much to it, and amen. Uh, it, it is amen. Uh, it, the Lord is um, mm. he is a wonderful and. Um, God and to Him uh, all the glory. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So I thought we had kind of a mixture of you two guys here. Um, what's that little? Where's that? I'm trying to think of that verse exactly. Don't don't d despise the day of small things. Something to that effect. You know, like you said, Lowell. You know this. I mean, here are these guys. It sounds like everybody is saying. His disciples saw and they said, boom, boom, boom. Everybody was probably making similar comments. I'll say it that way. And, but, you know, the Lord chided them. He, he just said, this is, the, it looks like a small thing to you, but it's, it, this is a message that's going to go out with the gospel forever. And uh, so, you know, my encouragement to the ones that are listening, um, Get together, like Josh has said again and again, talk about, talk over the Bible, and don't be afraid of uh, getting it wrong. You know, you're going to say something that's not very accurate or it's goofy or stuff like that. No, talk about it. Things will come out. The Lord will guide. He's, you know, look at these guys, these young guys. I'm thinking that most of them were in their late teens, maybe early 20s. And they're accompanying this rabbi everywhere, all over. And uh, they are making a lot of mistakes as they go. They're going to make a lot of more mistakes as they continue on afterwards. But I tell you what, um, this is the path that's need to be that's laid out in God's sovereignty. 
And this is what builds the church up when it's the day of small things. In, in that day, at the, at, at the celebration, at the judgment seat, right after the judgment seat of Christ, things are going to come out that will go, whoa, I never knew that. I never saw that. How come, you know? So keep going. Keep at it. Amen. And uh, Amen. trust in him. Hmm. Amen. Amen. Is it okay if I close in prayer, gentlemen? Yes. Yeah. So, Father, we just bow before you. Mm -hmm. And, Lord, we see in this passage of a scripture the world's evaluation of the worth of man as 30 pieces of silver. Mm -hmm. But also we see your evaluation of a human soul, mm -hmm. the blood of Calvary. And what a price was paid for our redemption and what a worth you have placed upon our head. And Lord Jesus, how could we ever thank you for paying the highest price for the lowliest soul Amen. that we may be children of God? Amen. Thank you for what you've done. Yes, and yes. Lord, we pray for Josh and Stephanie and the kids that you would watch over them for good and bring them to health Lord, and, and guide their steps. Thank you for this time and pray for the dear people who are listening to and observing this this study, Lord, just fill them with your spirit and, and whet their appetite for your word. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.